Janet, you There's a microphone if you want, just to the left of the computer. It's not on yet. Welcome to the inaugural session of the 2018-19 series on Pottery and Excellence. Um, we're excited that we have a big enough crowd. We had to move out of our usual seminar room. So thank you all and welcome. And I think a big thank you to our speaker for coming up with a title, topic, or fan club that uh, <laughs> well, we're doing. No. I'm Janet Carlson. I'm the faculty director of the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. It's a center based here in the Graduate School of Education, which I think most of you are well aware of. And our role is to consider excellence in teaching from the perspective of looking at the persistent problems of practice. In other words, we're looking for the hard problems that people haven't figured out how to solve. And we want to work in partnership with schools, foundations, organizations to see if we can make a difference in that world of teaching as it relates to learning. And all of our Pondering Excellence speakers do something in that space and we ask them in particular to design their talks to help us as a collective ponder excellence and what does it mean. I could not be more excited to have Anthony as our first speaker this quarter. Um, I was trying to think about how to introduce him <laughs> and I decided to pull from a letter of support we wrote for you for an application. Aww. So I won't read the whole letter because then you won't even have a head that fits in this room. Uh. <laughs> but um, I've had the privilege of working with Anthony for four out of his five years that he's been in the doctoral program here and it has been an absolute joy. Part of the reason for that is he has a passion for learning um, and that includes both his own learning as well as the learning of any students he comes in contact with. He does have an excellent reputation as a teacher and he is a more than budding researcher. So we are proud to call him our own at CSET. He's been a very proactive person in seeking out opportunities to grow as an educational scholar. He in particular has participated in a number of professional conferences giving presentations on the NSF project that we work on together as well as, as his own research, um, including designing a workshop that's about researching professional development facilitation practices. He did that at the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics Research Conference. He um, somehow wrangled himself onto the program in Toulouse, France in the last year. Um, and very excitingly, he will be a keynote speaker at a major math conference at Asilomar in December, not November, right? Um, so we're very, again, we're very proud to have Anthony as a part of the CSEC community. He also is an integral to the Graduate School of Education. When he began his time as a doctoral student, he was elected, I don't know if it's an elected position or an appointed volunteer type position, but he was social chair <laughs> for the uh, Graduate School of Ed St Student Guild. And from there, he was elected as one of the presidents of the guild and stayed in that role for two years. I mention that because under Anthony's leadership and the group that he worked with, I watched the guild grow into a force to be reckoned with. And I mean that in the most positive sense. I feel that the Guild has been instrumental in shifting the culture and the conversation of the GSE. And I think Anthony is one of the key people in doing that. I also see some of his compatriots out there, and I thank you also <laughs> for that. Throughout all these roles, teacher, researcher, I'll say student um, advocate, uh, one of the ways to think about Anthony is as a thoughtful, reflective colleague who constantly supports the greater good. We could not be more fortunate to have Anthony share his work with us today. So join me in welcoming Anthony as our first speaker this year. Thank you. Quite the intro. <laughs> um, so in thinking about what I was going to talk about today, I really titled this for a very specific reason. And I didn't put the re in parentheses just to have us like rethink in the terms of that we haven't thought about it before. But I want us to revisit. I want us to think about what we have been thinking about in the classroom and how we can actually improve that. 
And I want to first start with the thank yous because we always run out of time for that. So I first of all, uh, this dissertation and the study that I'm going to share with you today could not have been possible without my fellowship through EDGE. Um, also, I want to uh, really thank my advisors. Um, one of them is here today, so thank you, Rachel, for being here today. Um, I want to thank my colleagues and my supporters. Without you guys, I, not, I would not have been able to do this program. And also the four teachers and 110 students that I got to talk to throughout these few months that I was at these uh, uh, two schools. So one of the things I want to talk about is the motivation for what I do. And so I was a teacher for 11 years down in Southern California, Ventura, California. And as a teacher, I got to teach freshmen coming straight into high school. And they were all nervous, and they were all like, you know, wondering what this whole high school thing was going to be about. And as I taught them math, I just really wanted to make it an inviting space. Because I know mathematics is very intimidating. It can cause a lot of anxiety. Um, it can be something that they have bad experiences with. But the problem is, is that as we try to nurture that inviting space, sometimes they move on. And sometimes those spaces don't seem as inviting to them. And once I build up a kid to try to say that you can do mathematics, sometimes they reach barriers where they feel like they can't anymore. And so in thinking about all these things, I was like, OK, so there's this word called equity. And a lot of us in education, we think about this word equity a lot. And I think we, well, wow, surprise. Um, so we, <laughs> all the way from Florida, thank you. Um, so we have these, uh, this idea about equity and what it could be. And I want us to really think about that today, what it is for us, because we all have different ways that we think about it. And none of them are wrong. We just have to make sure that we always reflect. I mean, some of us think of it's a way to add up in the world, to add social justice. I want to see equality. I just want to make a difference. These are all very valid ways. But we have to come together and see how those all work together. Um, and so as I was thinking about my research and my study and what I think about the student voice, I thought about like boost, elevate, raise, and I just didn't know what to land on. And finally, I landed on legitimize. And today I want to talk about that today. So like my progression of like my teacher um, going into these classrooms and now what I'm kind of seeing as I'm studying this and researching it. So the roadmap for today so you don't get too, too lost. Um, I'm going to talk about why group work. Why authority and why this word legitimization? I want to give you the context so you kind of understand where I'm coming from. Um, I want to show you some student survey results. So I did some student surveys and they have some very interesting findings. Um, I want to focus on one particular small group and have us kind of look at how the kids are interacting, how they're talking to each other. And then lastly, I want to hear from Jimmy. And we'll talk about Jimmy very last. So why group work? So when I think about equity, I really pull from a lot of Rochelle Gutierrez's work. And she talks about these different dimensions of equity. And so the first dimension of equity that she talks about is she talks about access. And when we talk about access, we talk about what kids actually can get to in mathematics. But in thinking about access, we also have to think about the opposite direction and the barriers that kids cannot get to. She also talks about this idea of assessment. An assessment can be really informative of what our kids know, how we can help them, but it can also frame and send messages to our kids about what we privilege in mathematics and what we don't. And the last one, of course, identity, is something that we can really build with kids and make them feel like a mathematician. But a lot of times, a lot of the times when they face a lot of these barriers or somebody tells them they can't do, that becomes more distal. But I really focus on power. And so power is the all-encompassing of these three dimensions. Because who gets to choose who has access? Who gets to choose the assessments that these children take? And who gets to choose how they build their identity and how they're seen? Um, this is where it gets a little theoretical. I'm just going to warn you, it's a lot of words. But authority is something really important to me. And it's like the crux of what I look at and how I look at because it's looked at in very different ways. First of all, authority is looked at as power. So this is the Weber, Weber way of looking at authority. It kind of looks at it like how society builds power. Unfortunately, we've kind of seen this play out. We are really familiar now with the patriarchy and colonialism 
within what is building and who gets privilege and whose voice actually counts. And we see that power does maintain, unfortunately. Uh, we see charismatic power. Other powers that we see in education, and this is kind of the fun one, I don't know how many of you have actually seen this, the sage and the sage I've seen before, but I never had seen the meddler in the middle. That's a, that's a clever one. And then the guide on the side, I think some of you are familiar with as well. But this is this whole idea of like, what is the authority between the teacher and the student? So this is like the idea that, I know Bene has come up with, Amit and Fried have come up with, and they're looking at the dynamics between teacher and student and the positionality of the teacher, right? And then the biggest question is, what about authority among students? So as we think about our own positionality as a teacher, we have to realize that a lot of the things that we set up in the classroom also influence the way that students interact with each other, how they position each other. And this is where I want to think about in terms of legitimization. Because when we think about the word legitimize, well, actually, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you take 47 seconds, and I want you to just suddenly think to yourself, when you hear the word legitimize, what do you think of? There's someone next to you, kind of talk about what did you first think about when you heard the word legitimize, and come to like a, I don't know, just listen to each other. What'd you come up with? Unfortunately, the whiteboard is back here, or maybe fortunately. <laughs> we are shifting the center of the room. So, any ideas that people had as they were discussing? You want to share somebody else's idea? You want to share your own? When you thought of the word legitimize, what kind of came to your mind? Yes, go ahead. Validate. Validate. So we had sort of two sides. So one was like you said, there can be popular support for something that can give it legitimacy, or it could be an individual lending their own power and authority to someone else or someone else's idea. So you're saying that somebody is uh, in that kind of sense of like validation. You're saying that uh, because I, as an individual, see you, mm -hmm. you're now elevating what you're saying. So this is kind of like popular support versus individual support. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes? Um, to build on that, we talked about there sort of needing to be at least two actors in the process that I, I can't really legitimize my own idea, but someone else can, or I can legitimize someone else's, I guess. Anything else? <coughs> yes? I love that word, I'm a little biased. <laughs> there, there is me legitimizing one word. Um, any, <laughs> any others? Yes? I was actually thinking about legit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. legit. Does anybody remember this? 
<laughs> Some of you are too young. What is, so what do you mean by budget? Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. That's actually a little bit different than cool because yeah. cool is not dependent on truth. Yeah. Right. We definitely have seen that lately. Yes. It makes it real. It makes it real. Yeah, yeah, I like that. It makes it real. Yes. We talked about it things counting. If a person is legitimized, their voice counts, their presence counts, their actions count. And then I saw him, yes. Thinking about uh, both explicit legitimization and implicit legitimization. Okay, and can you kind of expand on that? Explicit yeah, so if I was working in the, like, the first floor of Saris and I blared music, that would maybe be a less legitimate way of participating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's like these norms that um, shape legitimate participation. Kind of these um, unwritten norms, but they're norms that we kind of like, you go into a library, you're not going to blast music. Right. You know? But at a rock concert, it would be really weird to stand there quiet. Right. Okay. Thank you. So when we talk about the word legitimize, I'm just pulling from Oxford, Oxford you know, it's not like that, that you know, here's Oxford like, oh, they're the ones that come with the definition. I actually like those better, I'll be stealing those from my dissertation. But um, the idea of legitimization, what they say is to conform to laws and rules, and I actually think this is kind of interesting in terms of the classroom, that we do conform to rules and laws within the classroom. But I think it's also really interesting that sometimes students choose which ones they abide by, and we can talk about that in a little bit. And it's also to defend with logic or justification. So in other words, I have to tell you, like exert the power in order to do it, but I also have to give you some kind of justification in order to make it valid. And that's how I'm going to legitimize it. And what's interesting about that when I say justification, it's not like that justification has to be factual, which is of course something we kind of brought up. And so, here are some questions to consider for the rest of today. Um, how are students' mathematical ideas legitimized during group work? And then, of course, what makes students feel comfortable sharing their mathematical ideas? And that second question is something I really, really care about, because I think it's something that's going to help me build some kind of ways that we can make kids feel more comfortable to share their ideas. So here's the context of the study. Here's the, the little boring stuff. So the context of the study is Aspenwood Middle School, that is a student in for a school in the South Bay area that's suburban, and it has about 1,200 kids. It has about 25% free reduced lunch, and it has a mixture, about a third each, of Latinx, white, and Asian. And when we break that in even further, it's actually way more fascinating, but don't have time for that today. The participant, I was, I said in the abstract that I was gonna go over two classrooms today, and then I, I wrote it out, and this, it was like 150 slides. And that, you know, we don't have time for that. So I'm just going to focus on one classroom today. <laughs> one classroom, one period. And I'm particularly going to talk about Ms. Alba. This is a really fascinating case that I stumbled upon. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it was uh, really, really exciting because Ms. Alba teaches an accelerated 7th grade math class. That's also called Math 7-8, where they teach mostly 7th grade math, but in the last quarter is 8th grade math. And what's really interesting is she had just returned from maternity leave. And the reason this is interesting is because while she was gone, her sub went ahead and did didactic, rote, mathematics, and structure. This was not what Ms. Alba actually learned how to do. What she wanted to do is she wanted to renorm the classroom to actually share ideas and do group work. So I got there right when she's renorming and she's trying to figure out how can I get these accelerated kids with all this academic status to actually talk to each other and actually share ideas and take time to explain. There are 27 students that I talked to and worked with on a daily basis. Um, there actually were 28, but one kid fell out of study. Not, not physically, he, he's, he's fine. Yeah, he's totally fine. Um, I was there for much longer than this, but this is the data that I'm actually looking at for today. I video classed every day over these four uh, weeks. You'll notice some white spaces where I did not film that day because there was no school because of professional development, there was no school because they had a math uh, fest, there was no school because it was just a testing. You all know if you're teachers. And the days I did film 
what I did whenever they did group work, and the teacher told me when they were doing group work and what she considered group work, I got to use GoPros to film every single small group of students. I then, after they took the small group work, I gave them a 12 question survey. And all the 12 questions were about was, what made you feel comfortable today? Sharing your ideas. What do you think the purpose of math was today? And I want to share some of those, like four of those questions with you today. I also did interviews with the students. So three students I did individually for very specific reasons. And I also did three focus groups. And I did more than that, but this is all I could finish typing up today. Um, so I did the three focus groups. And in that, I let them choose their own friends to come and talk together. And man, were they really honest, <laughs> especially with each other. So I talked to about 13 of the 28 students that were in the class. So here are some results. And I just want you to look at these really, really quickly. So the th uh, three of the questions that I'm going to share with you right now are about the processions of the classroom themselves. So what did you need in order to do, be successful in your math class today? How comfortable were you sharing your thinking in the whole class today? Uh, what was the purpose of discussion in your math class today? And here's the first question. What did you need in order to be successful today? I want us to focus on the gold bars for today. Uh, the brown is not showing up. I'm going to turn off the lights a little bit. So uh, I want us to focus on the gold bars today. The gold bar says, listen to and make sense of other students' reasoning. That was the purpose of the class for that day. See a trend? Oh, yes, go ahead. Clarification. Yeah. Um, was this open response, or were they choosing? It was multiple choice. Okay. So this uh, particular question had these three responses, and they had to choose the one that fit best. Okay. And so the three responses being solve problems using the steps the teacher showed me, listen to and make sense of other students' reasoning, or finish all my work as the purposes of this. And as we see, there is a trend that is going up in the gold raw bars on day 4, 8, 9, and 11 of the unit of lessons. Very interesting. Again, this is her renorming the classroom. What's also really interesting is how comfortable they felt sharing their ideas in the whole class. How comfortable were you sharing your thinking in the whole class today? The pink is not comfortable, brown is somewhat comfortable, and gold is very comfortable. And again, we see this amazing trend to almost over half of the class. Now, those of you that are teachers, and you ask the whole class a question, you know if half of the class raises their hands, there's something good going on. Especially from down to 29%. We also see the somewhat is going down. And I noticed this one only because for the somewhat, that's kind of where the shift, I think, actually took place. I still have to look at the individual students. But the pink didn't really change that much, so that's what I'm guessing is the kind of kids that were comfortable, guess what? They're not comfortable in math class. Um, this one kind of threw me for a loop. What was the purpose of discussion in your math class today? Pink was make sure I did the problem the way the teacher taught me. Brown, check to see if our answers are correct. Gold, learn different ways that work to solve a problem. So the work to different uh, ways, when I thought about, oh, the purpose of them is to listen to each other's reasoning, I thought that would coincide. But it did not. We actually see a dip on day nine. We'll get to that later. So there were four other questions about the percent, uh, perceptions of comfortability and authority in the small groups. But today, I want to focus on one because we would run out of time. And this one actually was the one that fascinated the most. How comfortable are you sharing your thinking in your small group today? So what we see here is how comfortable are you sharing your thinking in your small group today? We see that very comfortable, again, has this steady climb to almost three-fourths of the class feel comfortable sharing with their peers in their small groups. And again, we see this somewhat going to like 40, 40, 22, 25. This is a good trend. So we should just be happy with these results. But something really stood out to me on this table. These two kids. It's two? two kids on day nine. What made them so, feel so not comfortable on that particular day? So I was a little curious. <laughs> so we're going to go and focus on that one particular small group where one of the kids reported saying, I was not comfortable. So I'm going to give some time to think about this. If you happen to have scratch work, you know, if any time you get math teachers in any room, if there are any math teachers in the room, how many math teachers are in the room, by the way? 
I don't see. One, two, three. Oh, yeah, yeah. I put a math problem in front of you. Here it is. You're going to make you stop in a couple seconds. So the problem was that Ms. Alba, Ms. Lucy, and Ms. Cost Mr. Castro are all writing mean math test questions. Ms. Lucy writes eight less than twice the number that Ms. Alba writes. Mr. Castro writes one more than Ms. Lucy. How many questions does each teacher write if there are 40 questions on the whole test? So this was the question, this was the math problem that the students were doing. So if you want to, you can go ahead and start exploring with this how you would solve it, because I'm about to show you a video clip of the kids solving this problem. Now you don't have to get an answer, and some of you are like, I'm not in. I'm not in <laughs> right now. So I'm going to go ahead and I just wanted you to get familiar with the problem so that you can understand what the students are working on. So what I'm going to show you right now is a clip of four of these students, and one of these students in this group reported not comfortable that day. Not telling you which one at all. Well, okay, maybe later. <laughs> but all I want you to do right now is just listen. See what you notice, what comes up as you watch this clip. It's only two and a half minutes, so enjoy. I will show it a second time. So if you miss anything, don't worry. Hey, you can't go on. I just brought a five. That's going on. 
Now let's come up uh, to my like journal to thirty five. Um and they forgot the rest. Five M nine. One. Um, so you may have noticed some of the names in the problem are different. That's because they actually use real teacher names, and so I have to use pseudonyms. <laughs> but I do want you to focus on the math and how they're enacting it. Um, so I'm going to give you a specific question that I want you to think about as you watch the clip again. But if you want to, and you want to focus on each individual student, um, there are pseudonyms. The students got to choose their own pseudonyms. And so that's why I have no idea what Jolteon is, but that's what he chose his name as. Um, so in the upper left-hand corner is going to be Jennifer. In the bottom left-hand corner is going to be Jolteon. In the upper right-hand corner is going to be Jimmy. And the bottom right-hand corner is going to be Ariane. And so as we do this, I want to go ahead and think about the question, how do we see students' ideas being legitimized? And we can go back to our list, which I like better than the Oxford Dictionary, of how are they being validated? Is there popular support, individual support, um, at least two actors in acting? Um, who's empowering? Who's cool? Who's true? Who makes it real? What things count? And of course, what's explicit and implicit? in how they're enacting this. I was thinking doing B, but I don't know. Do M. I'm not the boss. True, I can He's do the M. boss. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. You are. Um, and I'm your superintendent. No, no, no. Did I fire you? <laughs> Whoa! I just promote you, and then I just leave. No, he would promote you, and he would fire you exactly right after. That's exactly what he would do. I'll do, um, when it's like, left in the story, he would eat less than his friend. I, yeah, eat less than I'm a friend. Can I write? Sure, great. To, um, to, um, like, oh, yeah, right. to, um, like, he's Okay, and how is that? And why is that? Because it's less than the spring, but it's also twice the number she makes. Twice the spring, but it's like one more season. Two M minus a, also I can write E, so I'm just going back to it. Okay, you didn't write that. It works, it's no, the same no, thing. No, 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 but you didn't write exactly what you said. <laughs> You're not following his rule. Which equals two and seven. Oh my god. But it's true. I, I know it's true, but you know. You're not M plus L plus A equals 40. You are, you are. M plus two M minus eight is two M minus seven or eight plus nine or eight. Wait, can you re say that again? M. First one is Marine plus five is plus her name is equals four. M plus two M minus A. Plus two M minus seven. Okay, I made. I just need to do that again. Simple. And so I will break down. <laughs> hey, you can't go on. I can draw a five. That's going on. <laughs> Now let's come up uh, to my like journal to thirty five. Um, and they forgot the rest. <laughs> five M nine one. So at this time, don't share out yet. Just like kind of marinate in your thoughts. Um, and we are comfortable with the people that you're talking with before going to discuss what things you notice, how are students' ideas being legitimized, especially given the, the framework that we developed here as a group. Uh, what did you see?
strategies and solutions. Interesting. Um, anything else? Yes. Um, so it's interesting that Ariana didn't seem to verbally participate once, uh, nor was she addressed. Yeah. I don't recall ever, like, anyone ever asking her anything, nor did she say anything else. Uh, but she was also writing on the paper, so it'd be interesting to, like, I don't really have any observations more than that, but it'd be interesting to see maybe what motivates that sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. She did not. She did not? No. Mm -hmm. She never spoke in her. She spoke outside her. Go ahead. She was speaking outside oh. her table group. She was talking. 
Yeah. yeah. So she there's a there's a group right behind yeah. which actually two of the members actually have friends in the group right behind them <laughs> that they interact with through the, the, the group work a lot, um, which is really, really fun. But with the group itself, no. Yeah. It was a little bit interesting trying to understand <coughs> Jennifer's role in the group. Um, and talking to Rachel, it sounds like they did have some kind of group role assignment, but it would be interesting to know what their roles were supposed to be in the group. Um, but she sort of seemed to be like, in a certain sense, legitimizing what Jimmy White was saying by telling people you're supposed to be writing that down. Um, and then another type of legitimizing, uh, and I can't remember who said it, but somebody said repeat this, you know, repeat that, because like they were trying to write it down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so again, that was part of the legitimizing that was yeah. happening. But I, yeah, I and I, I, I think that was Jennifer, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. yeah. to repeat that. Yeah. Anything else you notice? Yes. It seemed as if a lot of legitimization, uh, particularly between Jennifer, Jimmy, and Charles Young, was occurring on the basis of the role and not, but like the role they were playing in the group and not necessarily like the content of their mathematical contributions. We think some of the interactions are just based on role and not uh, mathematical content. I want to step back a little bit and draw a circle around all four names and say that the use of language um, and maybe even videoing it is a way of legitimizing, of the students as a whole legitimizing uh, their ideas or their ideas being legitimized. Yeah, I, I have to say as a, as a researcher, right, I come in and I'm saying, hey, I value your ideas, I want you guys to talk, I'm going to analyze it. And that legitimizes a lot that you know they have this. Oh, the Stanford guys coming in to listen to us. It's interesting. But it's also, individuals would be solving in previous incarnations um, problems on their own, but here they're talking about it, which is great. And that's yeah. The group. yeah. Oh yes, go ahead. Um, when Jennifer and Charles Young were talking about the group, they were talking about the group and I don't know if legitimizing is the right word, but I definitely saw it as like a bid for authority that he kind of repeated it back in a like, duh, this is easy, you should get this kind of way. <laughs> That's an interesting, uh, I'm going to put that as repeated back. Because <laughs> <laughs> attitude wouldn't fit. Yes? Um, it was kind of related to the like, Jennifer Goldman idea. I just like, I thought it was interesting. like a bit for attention. Yeah. yeah. We don't know. We don't know. Yes, go ahead. I also thought it wasn't Joel Dion's ideas that were being delegitimized. It was his behavior. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. And my read on it, which is making a lot of inference, is that he's somebody who does often go ahead without the rest of the group. Like he was just said, like, he said, you're going on ahead without us. And he said, I only wrote five. And so they were kind of like trying to bring him in. Yeah. Go ahead. I didn't know that uh, there were necessary books. Roles, but again, going back to like the implicit um, authority. Yeah. So I thought there was maybe more social capital that um, certain act. So Jennifer was maybe pulling on um, that she had a higher social status uh, in the classroom that was allowing her to play the role of gatekeeper of ideas, or at least of who was presenting them. Um, and so again, going back to it wasn't necessarily the math ideas that was that were being legitimized. It was the uh, yeah. social hierarchy. Yeah. And I put that in quotations because maybe, you know, that it could, she could have that. Um, I'm like, I know my classroom really well, so I'm like, I know. Is that a hand? Sorry. Oh. So, what yes. does Ariana write? Ah, that's a good question. Do you know? Um, I do in one day, not on this day. So, uh, that, yeah, that, that gets outside of what we're talking about. But um, I do uh, have recordings of what she actually wrote on a particular day because I really want to track who she's copying from and who she's writing from. Because that's also, even though this is nonverbal and not, she's not really addressed, there is some legitimization that she's doing of other people by what she actually writes down. Right? And so I'm curious about that too, but that's, you'll read about that next year. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I think like refusal is an important tool. To, ah, um, refusal. Say that something 
something is not legitimate, so the way the group is operating is not legitimate, and by refusing to participate, that I refuse that like So who would you say, when you say the Ariana. refusal, like? So Ariana is like refusing to participate, and I think that refusal is a way to be legitimized. Mm -hmm. And I'll put that in quotes also, just to maybe, you know, I, I think that's a valid point. Last one? Yes, go ahead. Do you know which of the group members was the one who said they didn't? Oh, uh, everyone wants to know the roles. Okay, I'll give it a I'll do that. So what's interesting about this particular task is that nobody had a role that day. Oh, what? <laughs> so... No, I nor was it a group, we'll get to that, I saw you, don't worry. So we have, <laughs> and so uh, this idea of equitable voice. And so um, this is one of the things that the teacher was trying out this day. So again, this is not teacher bashing at all because she's really trying to think about different ways to renorm this classroom and I wanna keep bringing that up. But in this particular day, she really wanted to make sure that everybody had equal voice. That's why I put the equitable in square quotes. And so what she did is she had each of the students take <coughs> turns being the leader of the group. And they were the ones in charge of telling everybody what steps they were to write. Okay? No one could go ahead was part of the rule. And the problems got progressively more challenging. So that's actually an interesting dimension also because depending on who chooses to go first, by the time you get to problem four, your demand for being the leader actually grew a lot. And it may not be something you're as comfortable with. So I interviewed the students after this particular task and asked them about this task. And a lot of students said that explaining is difficult when still learning a new concept. And then this opened up a whole other, I just wanted to explore this, like, what does it mean to explain? So let's hear from Jimmy. So Jimmy was the one that reported not comfortable. And he was also the leader of this group. What? <laughs> it's like the big reveal. JR got shot. <laughs> and so I want to go ahead and discuss Jimmy's perspective because I interviewed him specifically um, after I saw the results of the survey and I really wanted to talk to him about really pro. Now here's what's interesting about Jimmy. Jimmy is like very positive guy. And so when I first started interviewing him, I'm like, so how's math? Oh, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Everything's great. And I'm like, okay, so how was that task for you? He's like, oh, it's great. It's great. It's like, so you felt very comfortable? He's like, oh yeah, very comfortable. Very comfortable. Wait, wait, wait. That's not what you wrote down. You wrote down you're not comfortable today. So I probed a little bit further. And so when I asked Jimmy about the task and really got his detail, he finally said this. Um, last week you guys worked on the task uh, where you had to each take turns explaining. Oh, that one. I feel like they couldn't do quickly and all that. I prefer listening to other people, mm -hmm. not a clean, because I want to hear other people's ideas first, so I can, so that I can work off of that, and like work forward. And then I asked him, so Jimmy, how do you, you know, feel about that? And he said, kind of, I, I don't want to do this, I don't want to lead the group. And then I asked him, is there anything else that you felt during that time, during the task? He said, uncomfortable, kind of, nah, just when I was speaking. And then I asked, was there anything else difficult about the task? He's like, no, just the explaining part. So it wasn't the mathematics. It wasn't working with his peers. It was the fact that he was told, you must explain. So, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You said it wasn't working with his peers, and it wasn't Jennifer who kept ordering him around? So isn't that a peer? Jennifer was ordering Joltian around and telling him that he had to, he, so he was trying okay, to. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was Jimmy in the upper right-hand corner that the one that reported not comfortable yet. And so uh, I then went ahead. Oh, that's the wrong button. Um, I then went ahead and uh, asked him about, you know, is there anything else difficult about the task? And then he just kept talking. <laughs> it's helpful to the people that like don't know and that need help because mm -hmm. it they got some information about it that could help them succeed in that group. Well, if you have a smart person and you have a person that's also smart, he's like not that smart compared to him <laughs> or her, mm -hmm. which that person could help that person succeed yeah. in that problem. That's helpful. Same thing. Or give them a, or give them a start. Yeah. Or a clue. Now I want to point out uh, three things that Jimmy says here that are really deep. 
And the first thing that I noticed was he said, they got some information about it that can help them succeed in that group. He is starting to think about going from an individualist kind of thinking of what mathematics class is and towards more of a collectivist thinking of like, hey, everybody has something to bring and they can help them succeed. This is how we succeed in math class, is if the group succeeds. He also says if you have a smart person, then you have a person that's also smart. I want to make sure you notice he said that. But it's not like not that smart compared to him or her. Um, in this one, he recognizes that everybody does have these different abilities that they bring to the group, and that everybody's smart in this class. And the last thing that he says, but, or but, give them... Anthony, yes, go ahead. But, not but, smart as. Not it's smart still, as, right. It's still ranking. It's still ranking. Okay. And then we'll, get, we'll get to that in a whole okay. different... Right. That's, that's big for three. Okay, so then, or give them... Or give them a start, or a clue. So in this one, what I noticed a lot of the kids talk about it, that the group work was not about getting the answers. It really was about explaining the math so that everybody could try it on their own and really figure it out themselves. So these are just the concluding thoughts. This is only for right now, and this is for Jimmy. So uh, who are the most successful math students in the class and why? So looking at all 13 different students in the interviews, they kind of came across these four themes. Um, the biggest one was they can explain it. And so the reason that this is so powerful is because every single kid, when I asked them, who are the most successful math students in the class? They always named the same two kids, every single student. When I probed further about what makes them successful, they then ranked them. They said, well, so-and-so is more successful because he actually knows how to explain it to us, and they know how to do it, and they help others, and they share their ideas. So what's interesting about this is that the students, every single time I would probe them further for what made them more successful, it was really like, look, they really can collaborate and help us all out. When I asked them what makes you feel comfortable sharing your ideas to all the students across, uh, the themes that came up was knowing the people in your group, which connects, of course, to being able to work with your friends. Of course, every kid's going to say that. Um, time to think was a big one. And we saw that in Jimmy's also. Being able, uh, sorry, students who talk was a big one. So someone like, uh, we had Ariana. Students actually didn't like working with her because she never talked. And they like to talk about the math. And then working with people who can explain, like I already said. To sum up, I just wanted to say one more quote from Anastasia. Oops. There it is. Anastasia. Um, her perspective on group work. What's interesting about her perspective is that um, as she was talking with her friends, the friends, one friend says, you know, we should really be grouped by the sim, same ability. <laughs> and also she's like, no, then none of us would learn. I was like, damn. <laughs> but she goes on further. It's fun also when you learn a different way because then if one way doesn't, because not one way works for everybody, uh, not, one, not one way works for everybody. So it... When kids learn a different strategy or how to do a problem differently, it's just kind of easier to learn that way. And she's specifically talking about working with her peers and working with other students. So some implications. Uh, the task needs to be group worthy. <laughs> and this is actually a really, really big one because as we looked at this task, it has one solution. It has one answer. And this is a problem with a lot of these group tasks that we give students because they don't actually require that students work together. These are tasks that can be done individually. And so we have to think really mindfully about the tasks that we have students do in groups, or a lot of these issues actually raise up even further. We need to be explicit in teaching techniques to explain thinking. So we can't just throw kids together and say, explain your thinking. But we do it. <laughs> And so we have to think about what are tools, what are techniques, and what are strategies that we can teach kids to be more metacognitive, to really know how to explain, that explanation is not clean all the time, that it's messy. Mm -hmm. Be strategic in grouping your students. You can't put the high kid, right, with a kid who is struggling, necessarily. It's not always going to work. So you really have to get to know your kids really, really well. 
one of the kids suggested, like, why don't teachers just give us note cards and we write down three names of who we want to work with? <laughs> Wouldn't that be easy? And like, she gets a lot of two. And then the last one, students need to construct ideas before sharing. A lot of times when we have kids share, we don't think mindfully also about giving them time to really construct what they are going to think about. Can we give them time to write it down? Can we give them time to pair share? Can we give them time to share their group? And then elevate it up to the whole class. So I really want us to reimagine our practice, and I really am inspired by Gloria Altaldua, who says, the struggle has always been inner and is played out in our terrains. Awareness of our situation must come before inner changes, which in turn come before changes in society. Nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images of our heads. So I really want to push us to think about how do we want to imagine and reimagine our classrooms? What do we want it to look like? And we first get in our heads, then we can ask, how can we get there? But in a lot of this idea of legitimization, I also like to think about the counter. And a lot of times when we delegitimize something, when we validate something, we also delegitimize without knowing it. So we have to think about what we're actually elevating, what we're actually boosting, what we're raising when we're doing any of this legitimization. And I like to think of Mumford and Sons from the song, When My Time Comes. And now the only piece of advice that continues to help is anyone that's making anything new only breaks something else. Thank you. I think I have time for questions. Oh, no? Oh, OK. No. You will take questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, one of your implications was, you know, sort of being mindful about how you create groups and how you group students together. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, ideas or suggestions for what guidelines would look like in terms of, like, you know, how would you go about constructing those groups in an intentional way? Yeah, that one actually, it, it changes depending on, so what's very particular about this, to give you some more context, is that they were transitioning from 7th grade math to 8th grade math, which is a whole new math for all the kids. And so a lot of people would run and say, well, we need to, you know, check the abilities of all our students. But what was interesting is that as they transitioned to 8th grade math, the, the levels of like achievement and what they were really comfortable really shifted. And so the things that I'm really mindful when we say like be mindful of how we group students, we have to kind of think about how we formatively assess our students and think about how we then pair them up and, and redo our groups based on like the kids that we may uh, kind of close enough together, but not like far apart, right? Things about uh, comfort in, for, in terms of who will talk to each other who, you know, you have to know about the social dynamics of the classroom. Um, I taught high school, so I always had to know, like, the cheese me about, like, who's dating who and who's, you know. You have to, you have to, you know, that's a little weird, but you have to know. Um, and you have to really talk to your kids about what they're comfortable with. So I was always talking to my students about, you know, who they work with, you know, best, why they work with best, and I didn't want to hear just like, oh, you know, who's your friend and, and everything like that. It's always framed as, what's going to help you understand the math better, right? Um, and so there's a lot of factors to come into place, but I think if I was to give like the main guideline, the main guideline is to know the context of the subject that you're teaching at that time because it's going to shift. It's going to flow. And yes, you'll always have the one or two students that is always the best, um, but it's going to be, it's the, it's the other kids that we really have to worry about, right? So it's not a complete answer, but I'll work on it. I'll get, I'll get you a little guide. <laughs> okay. I'll work on it. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, this is great and fascinating. I'm curious what, to what degree the video plays such a role here that you um, add or even ask students to bring video into their own learning. Do students um, find a role of bringing the video you took into their own learning? Do you introduce it? Um, where does uh, I love this implication. The video guide by the side. Yeah, um, the video is really important to me. I love video. Uh, I think video should be used a lot more in education and professional development. But, um, yeah, the video of the student learning, so I didn't get to share this part because I'm not done looking at it. 
but I do an app with an iPad where students get to actually uh, share their thinking um, individually and do their own like uh, almost like a con almost their own Khan Academy, right? That they then get to share with their peers and talk to each other about the different things, right? So there are all a lot of implications about how you can use video and clips and um, things with each other students, right? Presenting an idea, uh, uh, having this group all talk about it and, and, sh and switch videos with other kids, right? Um, I think that takes a lot of time. It's really expensive and all those things, but luckily we all have these like smartphone devices. And so it's kind of an interesting thing, like how can we rethink the technologies that we have and how can we use them meaningfully, not just make it a fun thing, right? So we want to make sure that this is something also that we do implement that technology that it's going to be really helpful that there are multiple solutions, multiple strategies, and multiple ways that, that kids can do these things so that, that that sharing actually is meaningful, right? Um, and then they can create their own forum online and they can share it because kids, oh my god, they love, they all want it to be on YouTube. They're like, are we going to be on YouTube? I'm like, no, I can't, I can't share your videos on YouTube. Um, it's research things. But yeah, those are all like, I have, luckily I have years ahead of me to think about that because that'd be really cool. And to share with teachers. Sorry, that's another thing. Like, as, as I work with CSET, um, imagine taking that clip to your math department and having that conversation, especially with teachers that are really reluctant with group work. I mean, that was a really interesting example of like things, how, how can we rethink the task? How can we make this more equitable? What does that really look for, like for us? What, are we, what is our really purpose here? Things like that. Sorry, there's a question right now. Oh, show me. oh, show me. Yeah, it's a cool little app you can use on an iPad. If any of your schools have you know, iPads that you can check out, it's really fun. And you can create a little classroom if you want to talk about that. That's, I'll be analyzing that data this year, right? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And then did the kids share out their ideas um, the next day, or like, how, did they, how did it end? The, how did that problem end? Yeah, that problem um, did end with a whole group discussion. Um, the whole group discussion was more about checking and correcting the, the answers and making sure everybody had the right answers. The debrief on that day wasn't anything um, special, but again, it's, it's more about the task. The task didn't really lend to much of a discussion about the different ways that you could solve it, right? And it's, I just always think about, like, what's the purpose of doing it, you know, if, we, if it doesn't actually lend to the learning. Anything else? Yes? So, probably already kind of answered this, but Maybe not, I don't know. Just in case, because um, the thinking about the standards for mathematical practice and mm -hmm. about the explaining thinking and, and constructing viable arguments and mm -hmm. all of that, that um, I know from your you know, information about your talk that that's of interest to you. Yeah. Um, I think thinking as you progress in your career about, there was the question about sort of explaining thinking and reasoning, um, but in the illustration that we saw, it would be interesting to ask the kids, was there explaining of thinking that was happening? It, it seemed more like <coughs> it was just verbalizing the, the steps that mm -hmm. were being done. And there was a slight moment of maybe making a connection between the language of the, the story problem and mm -hmm. the variables a bit, but but there wasn't it wasn't very much developed. And so the, it's, it's interesting when over the course of the four sessions, everybody highlighted um, somebody who can explain their thinking, I believe, was one of those criteria mm -hmm. that, you, that yeah. they mentioned. Um, and so just to delve deeper into, you know, as a researcher, what does that mean? And then for the children going through this transformation, how are they, you know, what do they view as explaining thinking? Mm -hmm. They think in terms of the standards, that may not, you know, what we were seeing there may not be what the standards intended. Yeah. It's that uh, I do think about that as like, how can we use examples of this? Like, uh, what does it mean to explain? So, did you explain right as a question, um, and differentiating that between telling and going through the steps so that they understand that explaining is a step further than that? Yeah, I yeah, I do think about that a lot. Yeah. Question. I, you thought it was really interesting. Some, you made the comment interaction was based on the roles, not the content, or somebody did. And yeah, yeah. We're experimenting with our not experimenting, but we're using. My colleagues are like I'm throwing out the rules. We have the task manager and the recruiter for because I'm having, struggling with it, and I feel like my kids aren't getting the content. And then some of them are like, oh, 
oh no, the roles are really working. And, and so where do you draw that line? Because, you know, where do you want them? Because you want them to be real world and to be able to work in groups and when they get out into a real job, that's important too. Mm -hmm. So where do you draw the line between do I continue to push for those roles or do I continue to push for that content and where, where is that? Yeah, I think that, I think, uh, so in the question of like, when to use roles and, and when not to use roles, I think a lot of it, again, starts with the task. Um, and thinking about the task, do roles make sense for that particular task? This task did not make sense to use roles in that way. Um, and so, and again, the group work didn't actually make sense for this task, and, and again, right? And so, in, the, in these, in these roles, if there's multiple ways to get to the problem, if there's multiple solutions, and then using the roles, there's actually a way to scaffold into it, right? So uh, I've seen some classrooms that use them very well in where they give all the students like individual think time, recording your own book, and then the roles are used in terms of helping each other share, what do you have, what do you write, so then the role becomes more genuine so that we frame it as, oh, this is so that you can actually pay attention to each of your peers' thinking. And it's not about like making sure this person's on tap, making sure that this person, you know, the roles actually become more meaningful. And again, we have to think about like, does it make sense? So we have to, this is where I think the Gloria Zadu quote goes even further of what we imagine. I always did that with my lesson for the day. It's like, okay, I gotta sit there and imagine how it's gonna go out today. And I, you know, I was wrong some of the times. But I, I do have to see, like, okay, if I ask this question, what do I, where do I think it's going to go? Um, and I think a lot of times that, that reflection, we don't have a lot of time to do it, but I think that's a good way to start, uh, to ask questions about those roles. Yes, Rachel. So um, I'm sure you and I are going to talk about Ariana. <laughs> but um, I, I really would like for you, for, for the sake of, of your wonderful audience, um, to share your thinking about what you said, about the fact that Ariana doesn't speak at all mm -hmm. and nobody likes working with her. Yeah, I do want to yeah, so, talk about that. Um, that worries me, Yes. you could imagine. Yes, it worries, it worries me a lot too. So say more. Yeah, I'm going to. Um, so when I say people don't like working with her, um, it's not as, as vicious as that they won't work with her. It's not as vicious as they don't like her. They just, the way they frame it is that we don't get anything out of working with her because she's not sharing ideas and she's not talking. And I think that this is where, uh, you know, teacher intervention could really uh, benefit, where when we talk about different ways of participation, participation in the way that we talk, you know, talking is participation. Oh, you, you shared your idea whole class, that's participation. But also listening is participation. Oh, you, you know, you recorded so-and-so's ideas, that's participation. You're being very mindful, you know, that's participation. And I think a lot of it has to do with the teacher coming in and saying how they're participating and, and really legitimizing her as a participant of that group. And I think that, that unfortunately, I did not see that, um, especially with a, a few of the, the quieter kids who students reported like, well, you know, and there was actually one whole group of four students that didn't talk to each other. And they, they all reported very comfortably, which was very <laughs> interesting. But again, there's a lot of layers to this, I think, and looking at uh, what is happening in the classroom. Um, and I really want to look at all the videos of her and really focus on her and seeing how people are treating her, because it concerns me, um, and how we can think about uh, a new framing for what does it mean to engage, what does it mean to participate. You are welcome to continue the conversation with Anthony informally, but let's thank you. And thank you all. Uh, we hope to see you in mid-November at the next Pondering Excellence.